Right. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Sarah. Um, I'm a PhD student at Cambridge. And the material I'll share with you today is part of my PhD project. So I'm very uh, welcome to your feedback. Um, and I'd like to talk today, I guess, on the same theme as what we've had in the previous session about job-related training. Um, who accesses it? Uh, and do you get any returns? Do you get any wage bump from participating in job-related training? Um, at the end of the presentation, I hope you can answer whether it's a question mark or an exclamation mark. Um, and to preface, my slides have quite a lot of detail, so I'm going to go through them quite quickly, but um, I've made them available online in case you want to look into them um, with a bit more detail. So to set the scene, um, automation, net zero, longer life expectancies, these trends are changing the UK labor market as we know it. Um, and on the one hand, we've seen vacancies, we've seen businesses reporting a decline in output because they don't have the skilled labor to match their needs. Um, on the other hand, we also know that fewer employers are offering on the job learning and that adult learning funding has been decreasing over um, over the last decade or so. And so from a trends perspective, we know that there are trends that are changing the types of jobs that we have available that will continue to be the case for the coming decades. Yet we're not prepared to upgrade the skills of our existing workforce, whether through reskilling or upskilling. Um, and so we have this looming problem and we haven't found a way to crack it yet. So I wanted to present to you today, what do we know about job related training? Does the market recognize it? And hopefully we can start thinking about how we might address this, address this problem. Um, so I researched two questions. The first is who accesses job-related training? There's quite a lot of um, literature already on different facets of adult learning. Um, what are the determinants on it? So I build on that existing body of literature. Um, what we expect to find, so we expect that those who are most in need of reskilling are probably not the ones who are able to access it. We know that people who are more highly educated tend to also be the people that get more educational opportunities. We also know that um, they tend to be in higher skilled occupations, so are probably more likely to have those reskilling options than those in lower skilled occupations. Um, the second question is, do we do people who engage in job-related training in the UK see an increase in income? Um, the caveat here is I've used the five-quarter data set. So we're using quite a short timeline. There's a chance that you won't have an income bump over 15 months, and I, I recognize that. Um, what we expect to find is that the market doesn't yet recognize it. And so on the one hand, it might be that we don't see a wage increase over 15 months. On the other hand, it might be that we don't recognize job-related training the same way we do formal education. Um, and so it's, it's not clear which of these two factors might be driving the results that we see. Um, in terms of methodology, so I use both the cross-sectional quarterly database um, and the five-quarter data set. Um, the first question is just who accesses, so I look at the participation in job-related training as my outcome variable. Um, for research question two, I look at wage in quarter five um, as predicted by wage in quarter one, uh, participation in job-related training in quarter one, and then a host of um, personal and job-related factors as my control variables. Um, and because I use the Q1 2022 to Q1 2023 data set for the five quarter, I've used the same for, um, for quarter, sorry, the same quarter, Q1 2022, for research question one, just for continuity. Um, then these are the models that I've used, uh, pretty simple. I use OLS regression for research question one, just predicting participation in job-related training using the factors that I've just mentioned. And then for research question two, um, I'm predicting log wage in Q5 using um, wage in Q1 and then the personal and uh, job related factors that I showed on the previous slide. Um, so I have five findings to share with you today. The first is a descriptive finding. So the first um, line you see is the female participation rate in job related training. The black line in the middle is um, both genders put together. Um, the blue line is male. Um, and I've looked at every quarter from 2013 through to, um, 
through to 2023 Q2. Um, and what the findings show is that obviously the participation rates have changed over the last decade. Um, the pandemic had a larger negative effect on males um, in the pandemic. Um, and it took male participation longer to rebound immediately after the pandemic. But since then, in the two years, um, in the intervening two years, so from 20, late 2021 through to 2023, um, male participation rate has actually increased at a faster rate than female participation rate. Um, and if that trend continued, uh, male participation rates would overtake female participation rates in 2027, which would be um, very different from the pattern that we've seen over the past decade. Um, this is an extremely busy slide, I'm sorry, it's my like full results to the um, OLS regression. So for the people in the back, the blue uh, shaded portions are the variables where I found a significant um, relationship between that variable and the outcome. Um, and just you know, the overall finding is those who participate in job-related training, as we expect, are not those who are most in need of reskilling or upskilling. So, um, for example, if we take on the left-hand side this section on edu educational qualifications, um, the reference category is degree or equivalent. So, people who have degrees or equivalent are more likely to be participating in job-related training compared to people who have GCSEs or no degrees or no qualifications. Um, then on the right hand side we've got a list of occupations and industries. Um, obviously this isn't that helpful because we're just comparing it to the reference categories. So we've also done the pairwise comparison to then look at, okay, how do each occupation in each industry compare to each other? And then what does that look like for the gender as well? But that's too much to share here. So I just wanted to you know, highlight um, that finding that there is some heterogeneity in occupation and in industry by gender at a statistically significant level. Um, this, we jump back to descriptive for a moment. On the bottom, the x-axis, we have proportion of industry that's female. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have male participation rates minus female uh, training participation rates. So what that means is, in the top left, we have <coughs> industries like mining and quarrying um, and construction. Those are heavily male industries and male participation outweighs female participation by a lot. Conversely, in the bottom right, we have health and social work, we have education, those are predominantly female industries and in those industries, females uh, train a lot more than men. Um, and the question then is, like, why would this be the case? Why does the minority gender in an industry train less? Um, the data doesn't the data doesn't, doesn't tell us, so we have some hypotheses. Um, perhaps the value of training is not recognized by the minority gender because this uh, lack of role models, perhaps um, a perceived lack of upward mobility, um, perhaps the job-related training is tailored to the majority gender in that industry, um, perhaps the majority gender experiences more competition in their career, so they are more likely to be participating in, um, in job-related training. Uh, to compete against uh, others of their gender, um, but that's sort of the qualitative side of it. Uh, we, we don't really know the reasons, we just speculate. Um, this slide, we're now looking at occupations. So I have the nine highest level grouped occupations. Uh, I have in the gray shading in the back, it's um, proportion of the occupation that's female. And then I've got male and female participation rates um, over the last 10 years. And in the top right, I've also put in the skill level of that occupation. And so broadly, there's three groups. The top group is the most highly skilled occupations. And in these occupations, we have the highest rates of job-related training for both men and women. It's sort of interesting that the participation for both men and women is stable across the 10 years, um, and that there isn't that big of a difference between men and women. Then in the second group, um, which is most of the occupations, so admin and secretarial occupations, sales and customer service occupations, these are all like level two in terms of skill level. But just in that second row, these are highly female uh, occupations. And there, 
we see slightly lower um, training, uh, job-related training participation rates for both men and women. Um, we see much higher uh, female participation rates in caring, leisure, and other service occupations on the very right. Um, and then on the bottom, we have uh, skilled trade occupations, process plant and machine operatives. I can't tell how much people can see, so I'm just reading them out in case you can't see. Um, and elementary occupations. And in these, we have majority male. So like 80% of these occupations are male. Um, and we ha also have the lowest training participation. Um, this might not be surprising. They are, at least for elementary occupations, has the lowest skilled occupation. Perhaps there's less of a need to be reskilling in the same way you might expect someone in professional occupations to be reskilling regularly. Um, but on the other hand, if we think about the trends that are changing the labor market, the first jobs that will go are the lowest skilled ones because those are the easiest to automate. And so from that perspective, you might actually expect people in elementary occupations, for example, to actually be training more, to be given more job training opportunities. Um, and so the fact that we're not seeing that isn't surprising, but it is a bit worrying. Um, then I turn to the last research question, the second research question. Um, does training result in higher wages? Um, I have three models. The first is for everyone, and then I have male and female. Um, and we were, as a reminder, we're predicting wage in quarter five using wage in quarter one, training participation in quarter one, and then hosts of control variables. What we find is, no surprise, the biggest predictor of wage in quarter five is wage in quarter one. Great. Um, it's a 15, 12 to 15 month difference, so we expected to find that. Um, but what is slightly surprising is that job-related training was a significant predictor for women, um, women's wage in quarter five. Um, it's surprising that it's significant uh, for one, in one gender but not the other. Um, but it's something that we would want to test over the last several um, iterations of the five quarter data set to see if this finding stands um, across other periods as well. Um, so the current status, we, what the findings show is we're broadly consistent with the determinants of job related training and adult learning that the literature has shown so far. Um, I think one thing I didn't mention earlier is the R squared for predicting job-related training was pretty low. Despite all of those personal and job-related variables being included, we were only able to predict like six to seven percent of participation in job-related training, which is um, pretty terrible. But it is the factors that the literature has you know, been showing time and time again does predict whether you participate or not. I think then there's a question of, is, are we, do we know enough about job-related training if we're only able to predict six to seven percent of the variation? Um, so I think that's something maybe to investigate. I picked variables based off of what we'd seen in the literature before, but maybe there's an opportunity here to see, maybe there's another set of variables that we're currently overlooking that would better predict um, participation. Um, second, I think, as we mentioned, there's some emerging trends about gender, especially when we look at industry and occupation. Um, and there's some evidence from that last slide that there's, uh, there might be a wage return for women. Um, I know I'm coming up on time and I want to save time for questions. So for reference, I've included a brief summary of the findings up there. Um, and yeah, I, I welcome your feedback um, and any comments uh, you may have.